thank you to everyone for joining us at the final event in this year's 19B seminar series. Um, I'm Ann Lounsbury from NYU. It's been two years since the founding of 19B. The organization is flourishing. We continue to host lectures twice a month in the seminar series, which is organized by the truly heroic Sarah Dickinson. There are also various reading groups, um, all of which are open to everyone, some of which have resulted in conference panels. And these groups include the other 19B, which is led by Helen Sturramarim, the Populism Group, which is run by Jenny Flaherty, and a very active 19B Art History Seminar co-organized by Margaret Shamu and Nikita Balagorov. And I think there's a link to that group in the chat. There have also been and will continue to be 19B blog posts on the Jordan Center blog. And our list of members to which anyone can add their name via a link that Sasha will put in the chat has now surpassed 300 people. And all of this is very good news for the study of 19th century Russia. After today, we're taking the summer off. We'll start up again in September for the third iteration of the seminar series. Thank you again for your continued interest and participation. Actually, you are 19B, so thank you for being 19B. And now I'll introduce today's event. Last year at this point, we had a discussion of what the first year of 19B and the seminar series had meant complete with testimonials. This year, very sadly, what 19V means cannot be separated from the reality of Russia's war in Ukraine, which is exactly what we're addressing today. My hope is that as specialists in 19th century Russia, we can have a meaningful discussion of a hard question. That is, how should our scholarship respond to Russia's war in Ukraine? Each of us will be limiting our remarks to just a few minutes in order to ensure time for questions and discussion at the end. So with that, please allow me to introduce our panelists. We have Yuli Ilchuk of Stanford, who works on Ukrainian and Russian literature. Taras Kaznarski from the University of Toronto, who also works on Ukrainian and Russian literature. Susan Smith-Peter from the College of Staten Island, whose focus is Russian history, including the history of regionalism. Olga Mayorova from the University of Michigan, a specialist a specialist in both the literature and history of 19th century Russia, and Kirill Aspovats from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a specialist in Russian literature of the 18th and 19th centuries. So I'll start us off with a very few words. My own work is largely focused on Russian literature, but I feel no need to defend Russian cultural production. Defending is not my job. My job is analyzing and understanding. To paraphrase Walter Benjamin, quote, every document of civilization is also a document of barbarism. So for example, if I'm reading say American literature, I can appreciate maybe even love certain texts while also attending to maybe even centering the ways that these texts are implicated in the horrors of slavery and Jim Crow. The civilization and the barbarism are inextricable from one another. As Benjamin writes, what we call cultural treasures have origins which we cannot contemplate without horror. I think that it's this fact that should be the starting point of our analyses. What that means to me right now is that I need to analyze how the Russian high culture I work on has participated in projects that are both liberating and oppressive. So it happened that when the war started, and in fact, up to a week ago, I was teaching a class devoted wholly to Gogol, an undergraduate class. In January, we had started the course by deconstructing, with the help of Ukrainian scholarship, Putin's 2021 statement on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. And then for the rest of the semester, virtually every week, the news yielded up more examples of how Russian literature including Gogol, was somehow present in the war. For example, in March, the director of Roscosmos, which is the Russian NASA, went on TV to recite Taras Bulba's kitschy, scary monologue about Russian brotherhood. And he did it, it seemed, in support of the idea that Ukraine does not really exist. Last month, lines from the same monologue were also spray painted onto the ruins of a building in Hastomel. So I want to understand what it is in the text I study that makes such appropriations possible. For me right now, 
That means focusing on the distortions perpetrated by the idea of vilicia, greatness, grandeur, bigness, or in American terms, maga. Many of the undergraduates I teach come to Russian literature specifically for the vilicia. So I see it as my job to complicate their understanding of the category. As Ukrainian sociologist Taras Tsimbal wrote in the very early days of the war, quote, Russia's grandeur has been more attractive and worth theorizing than the provincialism of Ukraine. The Russian narrative is clearer and better understood than our Ukrainians' complicated attempts to convey a sense of their own identity. I think this is true. And the texts I often teach, for example, War and Peace, Dead Souls, are themselves invested in ideas of grandeur to one, to one degree or another, but they also critique this idea. So I'll just give one example before wrapping up. That example is Dead Souls. Gogol's narrative is punctuated by some of the most famously grandiose, I would say borderline crazy, statements about Russian greatness. And yet these claims are made against a backdrop of anti-greatness, cultural meagerness, poverty, fragmentation, incoherence, detritus, provincialism. So I think one contribution I can make is that together with students, I can read Dead Souls and texts like Dead Souls as symptoms of a persistent gap between aspiration and reality. So thank you very much. And now let us go to Yulia Ivchuk. Thank you, Anne, and thank uh, all organizers. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Uh, for getting us together on uh, such an important date. Uh, so today we celebrate the memory of Saint Thrills and Methodius who brought literacy to Kiev and Rus. And all Slavonic uh, philologists uh, congratulate each other with the uh, day of uh, uh, Russian culture and literature. So I will start uh, with the point that um, a lot of scholars of 19th century already addressed canceling Russian culture and how we can contribute or actually resist this uh, common uh, trend uh, um, globally. So uh, many members of the global community followed the Ukrainian intellectuals call uh, to impose cultural sanctions on Russia and cancel Russian culture altogether. Unfortunately, as scholars of primarily Russian literature, we cannot throw overboard Pushkin, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky that easily, but we can do a lot to decolonize the way we teach and write about the Russian culture. Uh, so I will be very brief and many of these points already discussed and uh, analyzed. Uh, so first I propose to divest the notion of distinct Russian culture or its ethno-linguistic emphasis. The Russian culture in the 18th and early 19th century was created by intellectuals of various ethnic and cultural backgrounds. The very fact they choose to write in the Burial language and they didn't have any other choice at the time shouldn't serve as a basis of their cultural citizenship. Even in this period, we can still use the terms Russophone literature of the empire or Russian language literature of the empire. Is the Irish or American culture a distinct English culture? They are largely Anglophone, but no one would call them um, as English uh, culture. Uh, so they, we still use the terms Irish and American culture, not English culture. So second, we need to uh, uh, emphasize the colonial tension between the writers of a titular nation and uh, the rest. Uh, what I mean, the patron, patronized relationship. Uh, without the promotion of Delvik and Pushkin and um, uh, Plitnyov, uh, without financial support of the royal family, the works of young Ukrainian writers wouldn't be published. So therefore, in many cases, those Ukrainian writers felt indebted to the imperial authorities and major Russian writers to publicly voice their allegiance as Russian writers. Uh, so, but in their creative works uh, and in the repertoire of artistic devices, uh, they uh, created the possibility of resistance of this homogenization of uh, Russian culture as uh, uh, imperial culture. So they resisted this uh, imperial domination uh, in uh, 
the strategies that I identify as ethnic camouflage, creating a number of fictitious uh, uh, popular narrators from the people um, uh, by using mimicry, hybridity, and self-translation. Uh, by bringing uh, the examples of Gogol's uh, hybridized speech uh, and analyzing in our Russian uh, literature classes, uh, we can uh, raise awareness of the existence of uh, the sphere of border culture uh, that uh, emerged uh, in the early 19th century. Even the major Ukrainian writers, uh, my second, third point uh, of this period, created their works in Russian. Two thirds of Taras, Bulba, uh, Taras Shevchenko's uh, creative output uh, was written in Russian and not only his diaries, but his romantic novellas. How many of us teaching uh, uh, Shevchenko's uh, romantic uh, poets uh, in our 19th century Russian classes? Uh, Kulish has published in his major novels in Russian or both languages. Kostomarov, most of his historical prose fiction in Russian. So how shall we define this output? Russian, Ukrainian, Russian imperial. I still prefer to use the Russian language literature of the empire. Uh, so also we need to include both literary and non-literary works of major Russian writers in our curriculum and draw students' attention to how the idea of exclusive uh, Russian culture was created and how it informs the restoration of imperial uh, propaganda uh, in Putin's Russia. How Pushkin, Gogol, Dostoevsky, and Tolstoy endorsed anti-Jewish and anti-Polish sentiment in Russian society. How Gogol's question, are we better than other nations? No, we are not better, was indeed reversed and used by Dostoevsky to advance the idea of Russian culture's global responsiveness and exceptionalism that fueled this and many other military conflicts of Russia on the continent. Uh, so by just uh, decolonizing the uh, concepts in terms of uh, uh, removing uh, the great from the courses, great Russian novel or great Russian culture. Uh, nobody uses the great French novel uh, in their curriculum. Uh, so we, we still uh, can contribute modestly in uh, what is now they uh, discussed in terms of canceling culture. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia, very much. Taras Kaznarski. Well, thank you. Um, uh, I have two parts to my talk today. One is sort of engaging with um, work of uh, colleagues um, with which um, with the works that I am inspired in my current research. And then I'll go to the main topic. <clears throat> so I'll begin with Yulia's um, uh, examination of hybridity <clears throat> as the modus operandi of Ukrainian elites in the imperial age to which they participated and to which they contributed. In this context, um, we cannot deny that um, exercising or performing imperial loyalty was de rigueur. Avidly or vapidly, opportunistically or reluctantly, most participants in the empire did that until the situation changed and they stopped. Uh, there are plenty of cases where um, that demonstrate that uh, performance, that outward performance of imperial loyalty did not preclude veiled or even open expressions of dissent. Um, so Ukrainian agenda, Ukrainian um, uh, push for cultural autonomy, <clears throat> cultural autonomy or social or even eventually national emancipation grew in contact and competition with more conservative, loyalist, or cautious circles of Ukrainian elites. And there were familial bonds, uh, familiar bonds, class affinities, local pride and sentiment, nostalgia, cultural empathy. All of this went into the forming of <clears throat> and defining of uh, Ukrainian uh, culture and cultural discourse. As Yulia mentioned, uh, most Ukrainian activists used Ukrainian and Russian, especially in the first half of the 19th century, and they navigated between the two media, linguistic media, um, depending on the genre, style, and message that they needed to uh, deliver. This brings the, um, opens a window to look at Russophone Ukrainian literature as minor literature, um, 
And we look at authors such as Narezhny, Gogol, Markevich, Kostomarov, Kulish, and so on. And it's quite uh, productive to look at them and compare them with Anglophone writers such as Thomas More or Walter Scott, uh, one of the possible directions. Um, not viewing the full response, full range of Ukrainian responses and engagements with the empire would limit our understanding of both the emergence of the Russian fusion of the imperial and national identity and of Ukrainian identity. In other words, from Ivan Kontarevsky, the father of Ukrainian literature and author of the Ukrainian travesty and Aida, all the way, you have to look all the way to the unrelated Pyotr Kotlerevsky, Bichkovkaza, who was of Ukrainian origin, um, has nothing to do with Ivan Kotlerevsky. So that's one connection to Yulia. The second that inspires me is Anne's work on provincialism and where I see um, um, myself sort of testing ground is the differences or the range, uh, the differences between provincialism, this plus Prashikonian placidity, so to say, and the regionalism where differences are more exotic or interesting or productive and all the way to the sense of frontier where difference acquires an edge or even a danger. Um, and it will come along with the re-examining of the notion of Karinaya Rasiya, that is what is it in the perceptions of society of the 19th century and what lays beyond, including of course, Petersburg. And then the final uh, and the most significant part that I want to concentrate today connects with all this uh, studies of cultural mythology. And I'll begin with one of the key strategies of Ukrainian elites in the 19th century, especially even in the 18th century, promoting the Russo-Ukrainian unity while maintaining and stressing the Ukrainian distinctiveness. This paradigm as articulated by the historian uh, Zenon Kohut allowed Ukrainian elites to buttress the notion of exclusive parity between the great and little Russians, privileging their place in the hierarchy of the empire groups, vying for recognition and advancement. This strategy and paradigm defined Ukrainian-Russian interactions since the early 19th century, contributing to the foundational cultural myth, the perception of East Slavs as the brotherly peoples, and its ultimate expression, extension, the Ruski Mir. And so this brings me to the main topic, uh, which I want to address today. That is the topic of love. In particular, Russia's love of, or love for Ukraine. So in the days of invasion and violence, we are still hearing the fragments and figments of phrases such as brotherly peoples, love for little brothers, familial issues to be solved within the family less so in the recent weeks. On the other end of Putin's propaganda machine, we hear other phrases, more so in the recent weeks. The necessity of complete destruction of the Ukrainian language, culture, and nation, the ultimate desiderata of Russia's love for Ukraine, and moreover, of Russia's existence itself. So let's talk about the notion of Ukrainophilia in the context of 19th century. Key contributions to the studies of this notion, phenomenon, uh, we find in the pioneering article of Paul Bushkovich from 1991, and the more recent one by Alexei Miller. So what is Ukrainophilia? A positive, supportive attitudes of the Ukrainian elites toward Ukrainians and Ukrainian cultural developments in the early decades of the 19th century, such as the Russian reader's amusement with Ivan Kotlerevsky's travesty and Aida, the encouragement of Nadezhdin to Gogol, the benevolence of Polyvoy toward Kirill Topolia, or Belinsky toward a small poetic uh, collection of Osip Bodyansky. So the traditional um, understanding of uh, why Ukrainophilia did not work out is that everything was nice and cozy and everyone was friendly until the Ukrainian intelligentsia became radicalized and pushed toward a dangerous political agenda. So let's take a look at it. Uh, and I think it is quite long overdue to re-examine the notion of Russian or imperial Ukrainophilia and test its tenets and limits. Um, and I would uh, illustrate it by quoting from Ivan Krajewski's letter to um, Mikhail Maksimovich, where certain key points are stressed. Uh, I'll do it in English translation. 
the sounds of poetic Ukraine always pleased my heart. For me, something native, Radnoya, something close to the ideal Russian, Idealna Ruskaya, wafted from those songs. Former Little Russia is important not only for us Russians, joined with you by blood and political ties, but for the entire enlightened world. Europe will soon want to get to know its East, to decipher this Slavdom, which from a while ago, subdued and in the dark, worked on itself independently of the West, and now emerges as a terrible force, bringing in a new idea to humanity. At this point, without the history of Little Russia, the Europeans will not be able to learn an important aspect of the Slavic spirit, since Little Russia is but a mandatory appendage to Great Russia." End of quote. So love of Ukraine by the Russian elites and intellectuals and administrators can be summarized, uh, especially in, in the period that I study, at the height of Ukrainophilia, 1830s and early 40s. It entails the following, relegating Ukrainian cultural activity to ethnography and folklore, bracketing Ukrainian history to a regional paragraph in the Russian historical narrative, treatment of Ukrainian language as a dead or dying dialect to be absorbed into the footnotes to the history of Russian language. The development of Ukrainian literature, initially amusing, alarmed Russian critics when they sensed its qualitative and institutional growth in the late 1830s. A Ukrainophile, Nikolai Polivoy, wrote a scathing review of Shevchenko's first collection, Kabzar, in 1840. This slim collection does not entertain any political program, but the fact that critics sensed the emergence of a major poet triggered his ire. How dare Shevchenko, I quote, to disfigure thought and the Russian language faking the Chachol tunes, in other words, major poetry cannot be written in a fake language that doesn't and shouldn't exist. And that's a Ukrainophile uh, stance. The appearance of Mikola Markevich's History of Little Russia drew the, the derision of Sienkowski and the outrage of Belinsky, not so much because of its scholarly weakness, which, which are evident, but because of its four volume size drastically out of proportion and scale with that, I quote, microscopic country. Um, Russia's love for Ukraine or of Ukraine also has, of course, the other side requirement of the love of Russia that plagued going a visceral kind of love. And that brings us again to the notion that Anne started her presentation with the dark underbelly of imperial culture and imperial grandeur. The imperial love for its subjects is linked to the peculiar nature of the Russian continental empire with its continuous conquest of adjacent territories and with its geopolitical appetite uh, blended with a civilizational or cultural mission. Yet with empire comes military devastation, violence, colonial exploitation and cultural oppression, relationship between the center and periphery and internal colonialism totalitarian control and violence directed toward own population. Um, but we know all that. Very good work has been done um, by Susan Layton, Katya Hawkinson, earlier Eva Thompson. And perhaps our way of to, to start seriously to decolonize can be a trip to the poem by Taras Shevchenko, for the Caucasus, which I think is something that we can learn a lot from. The poem was born in 1845 out of love and grief for the loss of the poet's friend, Yakiv de Balmen, a Ukrainian nobleman of Scottish descent, a visual artist and aspiring writer, who was killed in the war between the Russian troops and the Chechens at the age of 32. It is the most powerful anti-imperial text written in the 19th century, possibly ever, as poignant today as nearly 200 years ago. It is a scathing and indomitable dismantling of the Russian imperial sublime. As the lyrical persona gazes to the lofty ridges of the Caucasus, Shevchenko never traveled there, he sees the imperial armies annex the frontiers and destroy those who resist, the colonizers who exploit the natives, 
the nobles oppressing the Serbs. Everything becomes a colony. Uh, all in the name of Christian love and superior civilization. All is well in the empire, and I quote, everyone from the Moldovan to the Finn is silent as everyone prospers, end of quote. And one more quote, everything is fine and silent. It's just the saklia that bothers us, Shevchenko says from the point of view of colonizer, the saklia that bothers us as it was not given to you by us. And it bothers us that we do not throw your churek to you like a bone is thrown to a dog, end of quote. So again, it's, there are four translations of this work, none of them adequate. The latest prose translation is a crutch, but I think a good uh, newer, even prose translation would be a great uh, addition to our revisiting of the prisoner of the Caucasus, the hero of our time, Amalat Beck, the Cossacks, Haji Murat, and 19th century. Thank you. Thank you very much, Taras. Um, we um, have Susan Smith Peter now. Hi. Uh, thanks to Anne and thanks to to everyone for for being here. It's wonderful to to see uh, all of us together. Um, what I want to do is a little bit different. I want to talk uh, more about the field of of Russian history as uh, as a whole, and I want to start off by talking about the the story of um, of a discipline that was very invested in the particular language and all the people from that discipline went to the kind of uh, titular uh, country of that language and they were very influenced by the literature and the history of that country uh, and saw everything more or less from the center. Uh, and then in 1979, the Iranian revolution happened. Right, and with the Iranian Revolution, uh, all the people in Persian studies had to start to think about where are we going to go now? Where are we going to study? Uh, they had all been very invested in the history of Persian. And so as a result, they started to work in other places like Tajikistan and so on and so forth. I bring this parallel up because I think that it's important to think about um, both the possibility that we could be you know, reasonably shut out of, of Russia as long as the people of Persian studies have been shut out of Iran, um, but also to think about the kind of opportunities that might actually be possible when we stop seeing things from a particularly uh, Russian-centric kind of way of doing things. And in particular, I just want to start with archives, because for historians, so much, absolutely so much starts with archives. I think it's really important to, to rethink how students do archives, how graduate students go to archives, and what it means to go to the archives. And I think this is a, a conversation that a lot of people are having, but I would love to have it here as well. For example, I think it's very important for funding organizations to allow, uh, to allow graduate students to put together a suggestion of where they want to go. Those archives might be in the UK, they might be in the US, they might be in Germany, they could be in Ukraine, for example. I mean, I could definitely see a situation where a lot of work could be happening in Ukraine uh, that was about the Russian empire. Uh, but I do think that if there's a continuation of the same model, which is, well, the normal thing and the thing that kind of gives you the imprimatur of being a true Russian historian is spending a year in Russia in the archives, it's a problem. It's definitely a problem because in order to get the visa, you have to self-censor. You know, it's just not realistic to think that you could get a visa without self-censoring. So the only way we can still have our independence as a field is to rethink about how do we access these archives. Um, and that also gets me to the, another question, which I wrote about in a blog for the Jordan Center saying, which the question was, uh, and the title of the blog, uh, you know, what, what do scholars of Russia owe Ukraine? And I think that one of the things we need to think about is how do we 
go beyond the Russian state, or if we're working on the Russian state, how do we not take the point of view of the Russian state? Because it's not necessarily the case that we should stop working on the Russian state. I think that that's uh, excessive and not necessary. But I do think that it's important to not take the point of view of the Russian state. And in some ways, the archives is very close, closely related to this question, because if you take the point of view of the archives, which is usually the point of view of the Russian state, uh, you start seeing things in a particular way. And that, that site has a blind spot. And Part of that blind spot is Ukraine, actually. Um, and actually, I have come up with an idea for a new book that I hope to start research on. Uh, and the title would be Blind Spot, How Russia Has Failed to See Ukraine, and looking at a series of uh, Russian receptions of uh, Ukrainian ideas and thoughts, and starting with Shevchenko, uh, possibly going up to Zelensky. I'm not exactly sure about the end point, but I do. I do uh, want to use my knowledge of Russian history to start looking specifically for that blind spot uh, and start thinking about, you know, uh, of course there have been people who have been working on Ukraine within the Russian Empire, but we can also see that that has not really been a central kind of focus. And instead, Ukrainian studies, Ukrainian history has tended to be its own separate thing. And there has not really been a feeling that the entire field of Russian history needs to keep up with that historiography. And as we can see with what's happening now, I think that this is something uh, that, that will need to change. And in some ways, the practicalities uh, of what I've been talking about with archives may also bring that forward as well, because if more and more people who are intending to work on Russia and Russian history are going to Ukraine to do the research, that in and of itself will have a major impact because the that period of being in a country for a year when you're at a very formative place where you, uh, as a scholar, it has a kind of influence that continues. And uh, I have to say that it has continued for me. And uh, I think that as students go, as graduate students go to other places, uh, that, that all of a sudden we're going to be seeing a lot of really interesting, innovative research, just like the field of Persian studies started to see as Iran was dissentered from their field of vision as it stopped being uh, the kind of practical hegemon that a lot of other interesting and important narratives started to arise and started to be seen as important. Because a lot of times what we see is that there have been things that have been written about uh, there are things that have not necessarily been ignored, but they haven't been seen as important, right? As Anne and the others have been saying, um, this idea of great and greatness, uh, that is also important for Russian history as well. And the idea of greatness uh, attaches most strongly to the idea of the state. And even though, even though we don't use that terminology quite as much in our work, in terms of creating our hierarchies of value, I do think that idea of greatness and importance does still very much attach to the center, to the Russian state, to Moscow and St. Petersburg. And so I think that we're at a moment of opportunity as well as a moment of challenges. And I would be glad to have a discussion with people here about what those opportunities are as well as what those challenges are because I think that these are things that are crucial to the field and things that we could all benefit from thinking through and discussing. And I look forward to your conversations. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, Olga Mayorova. Thank you, Anne. We all know Ukrainian and Russian cultural histories are deeply interwoven. Uh, and there are many ways to explore how they are linked to one another as immense research on the topic has shown. But with the outbreak of the war, it has become urgent, perhaps more urgent than ever before, to tell the interwoven history
histories of Russian and Ukrainian cultures without translating them. The war demands that we make our optics sharper because we are dealing with a present that sheds a new and bleak light on the past. Since the outbreak of the war, I have been haunted by the question of the cultural roots of the war. What are they? And how far back in the past do they reach? I'm not asking whether Russian 19th century imperialism is responsible for creating the conditions for the current tragic development. The answer is obvious, I believe. But I'm asking, is Russian literature implicated in creating the conditions for the war? Russian 19th century national discourse was dominated by the notion of uh, all Russian nation that encom encompass uh, um, Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians labeled respectively as great, little, and white Russians. In Russian studies, we are accustomed to thinking in terms of a state public binary, which makes the state and its official ideology accountable for bad things while removing responsibility from the public. Yet that binary opposition cannot help in the case of imperial discourse in general, and in the case of Ukraine in particular, since the notion of an all Russian nation was deeply spread and deeply embedded in 19th century Russian culture. Writers often subscribed to that notion or conveyed it implicitly. This is why deconstructing it is an epistemological challenge, one that sometimes is hard to overcome. In order to support this claim, I don't think I need to focus on the classical texts privileging Russianness over Ukrainianness, such as the second version of Gogol Staras Bulba. And I do not need to focus on Dostoevsky. His enthusiasm about the Russian imperial project is well known. And it is not surprising that his critical response to the short stories of Marko Vavchok, uh, the Ukrainian and Russian female writer, ignored their Ukrainian context completely. What demonstrates the insidious prevalence of the idea of the old Russian nation better is that even Tolstoy, who was in political opposition to empire building, refrained from clearly differentiating between Ukrainians and Russians. I have in mind his short story, Two Old Men, Dvastrika, written for the newly literate public in 1885, when Tolstoy's anti-imperial attitudes were already fully developed. As the story setting shifts from Russia to Ukraine, the narrative introduces a few phrases in Ukrainian serving as markers of Ukrainian identity, but then the prevailing vernacular of the Ukrainian characters, even of children, becomes Russian and the narrative completely smooths over the cultural differences between Ukraine and Russia. Implicitly and perhaps subconsciously, Tolstoy submerged the Ukrainian Ukrainian identity beneath the Russian one, and thus validates the notion of an all Russian nation rather than di disturbing it. I have mentioned this short story not to expose Tolstoy or reproach him anachronistically, but to historicize the problem and to, su to support my claim, profound, non-discriminatory and sustained efforts need to be made to deconstruct the typical 19th century representations of Ukraine, which are deeply, deeply embedded in Russian literature. My second and concluding point is that not all 19th century Russian writers were unable to come to terms with the idea of Ukraine as a separate nation. Those who were intimately familiar with Ukraine sometimes grew up in, uh, in, in it or in the close proximity to it, uh, to Ukraine. They often, though not always, engaged with it as a distinct national culture. These authors include Nikolai Reskov, Vladimir Karalenko, and the poet Alexei Konstantinovich Tolstoy, 
and many others. I want to call attention, especially to the school set of articles about Taras Shevchenko's grave near Kaniv as a pilgrimage destination and, set, and setting for a Ukrainian national commemorative cult. It is hard, I believe, to find a text composed by a Russian writer that celebrates Ukrainian national sentiments in the 19th century more vividly. But writers like Liskov and especially their stories and poems about Ukraine have been marginalized in the Russian literary canon. As long as these writers remain marginalized, it is hard to discern the anti-imperialist pro-Ukrainian face of Russian literature. This prompts us to rethink the dominant canon of Russian literature. In conclusion, I want to say that we are living through one of those historical moments when it feels like scholarship is powerless to resist violence or to change anything. But I truly hope that the academic work of deconstructing imperial attitudes and reframing the literary canon can not only be revelatory, but can excavate those aspects of Russian culture that might lay the ground for a new post-Putin Russia and for post-colonial understandings that one day may be needed even in Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga. And our last speaker is Kirill Aspalat. Yes, thank you. I'm going to be uh, drawing in a lot of uh, points made by other speakers and uh, I'm going to begin where uh, uh, Olga uh, uh, stopped, and by saying this kind of, of course, we have uh, we have the sense that uh, our scholarship does not actually matter. But what I was struck by as the war unfolded, as I was watching it, basically in my Facebook feed, uh, or its uh, kind of manifestations, right, of how intense the debate on Russian culture but also questions of ideology, nationshood uh, was, right? Uh, both for people who are uh, writing from Ukraine as they're being bombed, but also of course on the Russian side, on the side of the aggressor, right? How, how much of this war is about discourse and vision of nationhood as opposed to uh, some kind of rational economic interest. There was a very interesting debate uh, among political scientists uh, on, on, on how do we actually interpret this in terms of the war in terms of interest, right? So what I'm saying is that, as Olga said, ideology matters uh, and visions of nationhood, visions of empire matters much more than we sometimes assume talking to our students in our, in our classrooms. Um, I'm not sure if it's a good thing, but it certainly is, uh, uh, seems to be true. Um, and uh, uh, I, I also want to go back to what Anne started with and Benjamin's uh, uh, Benjamin's uh, text, right? The thesis on the concept of history, which has also been a uh, inspiration for me, or at least a kind of a guiding light in thinking about what do we do as historians in this situation, right? And this uh, as specifically, what do we do as as Russians? Uh, I'm uh, a Russian citizen uh, uh, in this uh, situation where we need to find resources to protest against this uh, this regime uh, and the uh, horrible crimes that is committing. And Benjamin was, of course, writing his text after the beginning of uh, World War II, after the uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, when he, as a left-wing German Jew, uh, lost all grounds for kind of hope, both in, in Germany, but also in the Soviet Union, and discovered the last kind of hope uh, in, in, in a particular study of history. Uh, a particular an, an anti-fascist study of history that recovers universalist utopian potentials in past cultures uh, and sees that as, as an antidote against, against uh, uh, dominant, dominant fascism. And uh, uh, again, echoing Olga's hope, which I also share that uh, we, we are building some kind of discourses that will allow us to uh, devise a post-Putin uh, and non-imperialist Russia, 
right? Uh, that fits very well with how Benjamin um, uh, understood the the what he was doing, right? Uh, uh, writing this text shortly before he uh, committed suicide, and the, the question of seeing Ukraine uh, from this kind of Russian perspective, not just a victim uh, of Russian aggression and a victim of Russian colonization throughout the ages, but also as uh, a uh, um, site of, uh, 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 of alternative uh, uh, options, right? Of uh, emancipatory options for Russia, for Russia in in the future, but also for Russia in the past. So recognizing this uh, um, universalist potential of what Ukraine stands for and has stood for in the Russian imperial tradition of the 19th century is, I think, central for what I'm going to be saying again as a person who comes from uh, from Russia and from uh, the Russian field, as opposed to being a uh, any kind of expert on uh, uh, on Ukrainian matters as, as, as such, right? And when I'm looking at 19th century uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, literature, I'm, when I'm starting to look at that, and I'm gonna be echoing a lot of things that Taras said, I think, uh, uh, what, what I see is that uh, when I look at Shevchenko, for example, right, who spent his uh, uh, huge parts of his life in Russia, in St. Petersburg, and when you start to look at uh, Shevchenko's writing from the perspective of this Russophone uh, field of, I love this concept that you have suggested, Russophone field of imperial literature, and this is this is really how we should be thinking about it, right? What what does Shevchenko uh, tell us, right? And again, I'm agreeing with Taras here. Uh, so it's not just that Ukraine is a separate, uh, a valid nation that deserves freedom and to be freed of oppression, certainly, right? Uh, but what it says to, to uh, for example, to uh, Russian readers, right? Uh, there is a kind of a utopian message of not just a critique of despotism, but actual kind of a, uh, a vision of, 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 of culture, of language, of poetry that serves uh, the cause of liberty. That poetry is there to lament the uh, uh, the liberty that, that has been killed by the empire, but also to prophesize the liberty, the return of liberty to society. And this is a very different dynamic from what we see in a lot of uh, Russian canon, which is very often um, centered on critiques of despotism. That is, def that is definitely true, but also lacks the sense of a uh, or maybe until the the uh, the very late moment, but lacks a sense of a kind of a potential for you uh, for a utopian revival, right? Despotism is uh, for a lot of Russian writers. Despotism is very bad, but also sort of eternal. How do you get out of it? And Shevchenko is one of the Ukrainian voices that actually project a sense that we can actually fight against it, right? That we can fight against, uh, against that despotism, that we have a language of freedom. In that sense, the uh, juxtaposition that, or the contrast that has emerged in a lot of Ukrainian discourse since the beginning of this war is that Russia stands for despotism and Ukraine stands for freedom. It is easily dismissible as an oversimplification, but I actually uh, uh, suggest to take it seriously and uh, 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 as, as seriously as we kind of take those categories of those political ontologies, right? And I think that it is very productive for us as Russianists, right, to uh, understand the place of Ukrainian authors in this imperial Russophone dialogue of the 19th century specifically uh, in, in uh, in uh, in those terms, and I think that what I'm saying is fits perfectly with how uh, what Tara said about uh, Shevchenko's poem on on the Caucasus, right? Which which is not about Ukraine, but again about deconstructing the whole empire in the shared language of 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 poetry uh, uh, and 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 liberty. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, the last point that I'm going to make is that once we kind of start going from uh, this uh, and, um, view of 19th century Ukrainian authors to what do we, uh, how do we actually connect them to what we know as the Russian, uh, the great Russian literature, the great Russian canon of the 19th century, uh, 
uh, and I'm echoing some Ukrainian scholars such as Ivan Zubin, what I'm going to be saying is that uh, 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 we, can, we can have a particular perspective on the Russian canon as such, right? So in uh, the post-Soviet or anti-Soviet situation of the last 30 years within Russia, within Russian studies in, in the West, we have constructed a vision of 19th century Russian canon, which is aligned with the empire uh, and a particular vision of Russian nationhood. But we can also remember that a lot of 19th century Russian, a lot of what we now call the canon of the great 19th century Russian literature was part of a very different development, was part of something that uh, uh, in the Soviet days we would call the revolutionary movement. So they were, they, it was actually a movement directed against the empire, but in constructing the canon, uh, in uh, uh, pushing back against Soviet Marxism, uh, we have sort of forgotten how much 19th century Russian literature was about protest. And a Ukrainian scholar such as Ivan Zuba remind us that, that let's look at, at the Russian radicals. Let's look at Herzen not as just a writer of melancholy and defeat, but as somebody who is very uh, vehemently opposed to, uh, to the empire and to this uh, um, uh, uh, kind of to the uh, 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 violent colonization of, of uh, Polish and Ukrainian land. Hands and let us see that this, uh, the, uh, let us recover the radical tradition, the 19th century radical tradition as the backbone of what we uh, uh, should not be calling the great Russian literature of the 19th century anymore. And in that sense, that is a literature that can be an ally to 19th century and was an ally to 19th century Ukrainian authors, right? Shevchenko uh, uh, talked to and was friends with uh, Nikrasov and Chernyshevsky and can also be an ally to uh, today's causes of uh, uh, first uh, 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 spreading kind of anti-imperial uh, pro-Ukrainian political stances within the Russian uh, space, uh, within the Russian speaking space, but also uh, in imagining, going back to what Olga said and going back to Benjamin's hopes, imagining a post-war Russia that would not be, uh, 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 that would be radically divorced from this vision of a country that has to conquer Ukraine, but which would be actually, uh, which would take its lessons uh, uh, in liberty from uh, Ukraine and the Ukrainian tradition as it has happened in the 19th century. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirill. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. I think that these, these remarks really um, complement each other. And um, as, as, we, as we go into discussion and questions, I wanna suggest that if you have a question, just put it in the chat. You can either just write question or you can type out your question. There's so many screens that I think it's gonna be a little hard if we just use the raise hand function. Um, but you know, we, we, we wanna open up the floor now and Sasha and I will try to monitor the chat to see, um, uh, to make sure that everybody has a chance and we will probably go in the order in which the messages are received in the chat. Thank you again very much to everyone. It may be that some of our speakers would like to um, respond briefly to one another. I know I got a couple of messages when the messaging for the whole group was turned off, um, asking for uh, Taras uh, Kaznarski's asking bibliography questions, which text he was looking at. So I think he would certainly be willing to share those. Um, and I see we have a question from Alyssa Gillespie. Alyssa says, in response to Taras's remarks, I would love to translate Shevchenko's poem, The Caucasus, into English, and we'd be glad to share the translation with colleagues for teaching purposes when it's ready. Ura. That's great. That's just the kind of work we need. Thank you, Alyssa. Susan, you had a remark. Yeah, um, I just wanted to respond to what Kirill was saying about uh, trying to figure out some kind of anti-imperial uh, argument. Um, I, think that, I think that there are a lot of interesting prospects. There are a lot of different paths that people were taking. You know, there was the paths of, of the Zimstva, of the regionalists that we've studied. I mean, we had earlier, in an earlier 
uh, the version of this talked about uh, Gatsitsky and the Nizhny Novgorod tradition. Uh, and I think it would be really wonderful to have that material studied in a broader way and, and a sort of more central to the, um, to the field. I mean, for a long time, this is before my time, the idea of the whole uh, narrative was road to revolution. I don't think we need to, you know, go on that road again because, you know, that that question is is somewhat uh, old. But, you know, still, I do think it's it's interesting to think through other means and other sources uh, and and look at the other people who were critiquing things from the point of view of saying, well, Nizhny Novgorod had a, a democratic tradition and also there are some people in Novgorod saying the same thing. So uh, in any case, yeah, I, I do think that's an important way to, to, to start looking. Thank you, Susan. I very much agree. Um, we have a question now from Harsha Ram. Parsha. Uh, thanks so much to everyone for their wonderful interventions. Um, I had a question around um, something that has also been preoccupying me in working on Russia and Georgia. And I think this is a question that I think Ukraine poses even more sharply than, than Georgia does, which is the history of what we might call um, and uh, of, of what we might call in kind of entangled histories, right? How to think about two, two regions like Ukraine and Russia that have um, shared origins and, uh, and often blurred boundaries, right? Particularly during the early modern medieval and early modern period, while still respecting modern notions of nationhood and sovereignty, right? Um, and that's a really tricky question, I think, for historians as well as literary scholars. Um, how, on the one hand, to respect, you know, essentially modern understandings of self-determination that emerge in the 19th and 20th centuries with modern notions of territorial boundaries and distinctions, while at the same time teaching students as well as ourselves how to think about entangled and shared pasts, right? In ways that are not reductive to some kind of perennial notion of a pure national identity. Uh, so that would be a question that I think that Ukrainian, the Ukrainian Russian story could pose particularly sharply. Although in some ways it's also to a much lesser extent true of Georgia uh, because Georgian national identity is to a large extent the product of a dialogue with the the Russian democratic and radical intelligentsia of the second half of the 19th century, all the way to the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks of the early 20th century. And this is something that's very difficult to actually affirm now in Georgian circles because the Georgian position on nationalism or national identity is always seen as perennially anti-Russian. And so this sort of shared or entangled history, which is not simply one of, uh, of a common empire, but also a common opposition to empire, as Kirill pointed out, right, is something that's easily lost in contemporary kind of nationalist uh, vindications of the past. So anyone who wants to respond to that, I'd, I'd be glad to, to, to hear the answer. But uh, thank you so much for, to all of you for, for raising really important questions. Thank you, Harsha. I wonder if possibly Yulia or Taras uh, or Susan, anyone might want to respond to, um, to Harsha's very productive question. Uh, I would uh, start if you let me. Uh, thank you, Harsha. Uh, I know that most of us work on the peripheries and border uh, cultural production, but we rarely include this in our curriculum. And I think uh, uh, we need to differentiate between the political discourse as it developed with the emerging nationalism and cultural production, because I don't think none of the avant-garde, any of avant-garde artists uh, were aiming at creating national version of modernism, right? So they uh, existed in this like global space of uh, different uh, uh, trends and uh, this, tension between a local and global is uh, uh, present at every single historical moment. Mm -hmm. Even nowadays, uh, there is a, a distinct uh, kind of differentiation between scholars in Ukraine who follow the cosmopolitan uh, kind of view of a Ukrainian uh, 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 identity, starting with Dragomanov, um, and then avant-garde artists and more national-oriented uh, uh, writers. And uh, so in, in order to 
understand uh, the sh what is shared between all these uh, national cultures. We just need to delve deep into what was going on within the culture itself. So I feel like we need just to focus on both on this uh, kind of shared space and also on the differentiation within the intellectuals and, uh, uh, in each national cultures. Thank you, Yulia. Um, I know Olga wanted to respond to that as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I would touch upon uh, not all the aspects of uh, Harsha's question, uh, but um, I was think, but um, upon some. I was thinking about the, um, the uh, interaction between the Russian revolutionaries and the Polish revolutionaries during the Polish uprisings. Um, the Russian revolutionaries, like it's, it's, it's uh, we know that Herzen supported uh, the Polish uprising. Um, uh, so what is interesting about that is that and how it relates to Ukraine. Actually, the polls were presented by basically conservative Russian press as traitors, as as and as proxies, as a kind of Poland as a proxy of the Western culture. Uh, this seems to have nothing to do to Ukraine of the 19th century, but it's actually very similar to how Ukraine is perceived now. In, um, in Russia. Uh, so in a way, Ukraine replaced uh, Poland uh, in Russian national discourse. It's one of us, but also the other. And it's a traitor of the Slavic um, world. So what I'm, uh, of the Slavic course, it's the embodiment of the Western corrosive and Western influences. So what I'm trying to say is that um, right, uh, the interaction is and the influence, and it's not only entanglement of the histories and literatures, it's a kind of shifting roles of each culture over the time that influence both sides, uh, that influences both sides. So. Uh, now, as in the 19th century, Russians, um, even the conservatives, understood that the Polish nation was more advanced, with more developed sense of nationhood, and they tried to mimic, to, to imitate some aspects of the Polish culture uh, in, um, and to impose some of the, its development, some of its traits into Russian into the Russian nation, uh, it, we see pretty similar things now with Ukraine. Uh, so Ukraine, as Kirill said, is not a victim for most uh, critical, for most thinkers. It's an, actually a model to emulate. And I'm, I very hope that the same, um, how the Polish nation building helped Russians to re, to re, to rethink themselves. I hope that Ukrainian uh, nation building project will influence Russians in a positive way. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Olga, very much for can that. I add a, a few oh, more? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll just add a couple more uh, footnotes and put a slightly different spin on Yulia's comment um, or answer to Harsha's question. Um, the entang entanglement, um, I think it's quite, sometimes it's quite difficult to pinpoint because uh, we know it from the 20th century. There is a front stage, there is a backstage. You have to project certain identity, perform it, and then whatever you say in the back, you say it privately. So these private moments are not always captured, but sometimes they are. Uh, either in memoirs or in letters, or uh, for example, one interesting um, uh, sort of, I could call it even a treasure trove of this exposure of the backstage can be found in the three volume um, uh, collection of all uh, materials linked uh, to Cyril and Methodius Brotherhood. 
that were um, collected by the third department, preserved for posterity, and then published in the late 80s, uh, 89, 91, in three volumes. So you can see there the interrogations of, and the, the Brotherhood was quite politically, it was no danger to the Russian Empire. There was no serious, unlike Polish clandestine organizations, Cyril and Metodius had absolutely no, posed no danger to, to the empire. And yet it turned out to be um, partly, probably due to Shevchenko's poems that were paraphrased and translated into Russian and read by Dubilt and his majesty. And then to his ultimate ire, he was really um, distressed by what he read in Shevchenko and needed out serious punishment especially to the poet who spent uh, nearly 10 years uh, as a rank and file in, in Kazakhstan. Um, so there you could find uh, letters between them when they are exercising backstage, talking about issues of identity, uh, loyalty, and so on. And then they're grilled by the, by the interrogation. Uh, really interesting case where you find these things. Sometimes it's more difficult, like uh, when you hear, when you read about you know what links become important family friends sometimes social um, solidarity but family and friends is always prominent and you could have someone like a uh, relative of Mikola Markevich all the relative absolutely loyal calling upon his neighbor and friend saying you know what there was uprising December's uprising in Petersburg show me your papers you need to burn it including some of uh, the um, original uh, manuscripts from, from Pushkin, who gave it to Markevich as a, as a friend. So, there, but it's difficult, but it's possible. And then I think some of these um, uh, available cases might teach us how to read the front stage performance, the literary stage. Um, we can also see how the notion of ethnicity uh, somehow plays in perceptions of uh, various literary cultural characters. For example, I remember in one of the assessment, maybe it was even Belinsky, when you want to deride Grich, uh, there is a, a one, at one point you bring up his pedantic German sort of muteness or deafness in gra grappling with Russian language. So the suggestion is he's a German, he doesn't even, it's not even his native language, the, about Nikolai Grich, the grammarian and writer. Or you could find, um, again, mostly privately, comments about Bulgarian and Sienkowski as those pernicious Polish Stirlice who try to decompose or destroy Russian society. So there is this, uh, attempt to absorb, but also danger or suspicion, as, as um, this has, has been studied with uh, in connection with modern anti-Semitism, how uh, modernization and absorption of um, uh, Jewish communities into Western societies still generated suspicion of we have now enemy from within. Something similar or possibly similar can be found in uh, Russian responses to um, you know, suspicion when even when there is uh, assimilation and supposedly loyal performance uh, uh, in the front stage. Uh, Thank you, Taras. Um, I know Shama Shahadat has a question about Belarus. Good question. Oh, you're muted. Uh, no, no. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Anne. And thank you for the inspiring ideas um, that you have. I was wondering about uh, how we follow political events, because I don't know what it was like in the US, but in Germany, after the beginning of the protests of Belarus, for a, over a year, we were for, all the Slavists looked at Belarus, and we had writers giving readings, we had um, lecture series on Belarus, we started classes, language classes, and so on. And then the war st started uh, in Ukraine, and nobody pays attention anymore to Belarus, <laughs> and everybody's looking at Ukraine. And now the same thing happens, lecture series, writers, language classes. And um, I wonder if we shouldn't I don't know, broaden our perspective a little bit and try to, to look at the 
individual and different and similar <laughs> cultures and at their entanglement and not run behind the political events, which are of course important, but um, I, I, I don't know, what, what, what do you think? So I, it, is, it is very difficult from the practical side because if you look at Belarusian literature, you also move, have to look at Polish literature because this is very closely uh, interacting and we can't learn all the languages, but shouldn't we try to have, yeah, to, to have a, I don't know, to have different focuses in, in one field? I don't really know how to solve this problem, but it's it's um, it's very striking how how Belarus disappeared from our public discourse and from our attention, and I'm I'm a bit worried about that. So, thank you. That's an important question, and I'm wondering if if anyone would like to address it, rather whether. Oh, so uh, uh, we, we didn't discuss Belarusian case because this is primarily the group of scholars on 19th century, but I understand your concern. And I think uh, uh, the uh, cross-cultural uh, cooperation between uh, many Ukrainian and Belarusian poets who self-translate themselves, like Ia Kiva translates and popularizes Yulia Tsimafeeva, uh, Ukrainian writers published a collected volume of contemporary Belarusian po poetry, uh, so it also should be brought to our classrooms. The question with Belarusian writers uh, is their self-identification uh, as Belarusians. Uh, although uh, Svetlana Alexeyevich was very critical about the regime, she never identified herself as a Belarusian writer. Uh, so, uh, so we need to bring this also to uh, discussion uh, uh, whether self-identification of contemporary writers is uh, uh, kind of our uh, factor of not including Belarusian uh, as part of uh, another national cult cultural tradition. Thank you. Um, I think the next person in line to ask a question was Susan had another question. And then after that to Alison Lee. Oh, I'm sorry, we, uh, let's let's take Susan and then then we'll go to Irina. Okay, Susan. Right, um, I think one thing that uh, is striking to me is that the conversation in some ways is showing the continued uh, influence of the Soviet Union, right? Because we're, we're bringing in uh, all these entangled histories. And I, I think that that, in and of itself is is really uh, quite interesting, and I do think um, I do think that there are there is a need to kind of think through things at all these different levels, and th it's one of the things that I'm that I'm finding a bit uh, difficult here is like we have the level of practical questions like I had the questions about archives. Uh, there's been a question about working with the Trechikov and others, and then there's the question of, uh, you know, how do we change our fields in a more academic level? And I'm, I'm sort of trying to think about, you know, maybe, maybe one thing that we need is just to have more, more fora, you know, more places where we could talk about these, these different questions. I mean, <clears throat> I was speaking to Mark Steinberg in the chat about, you know, perhaps there could be a place on H Russia or H Ukraine where we could share uh, where people have done research on Russia outside of Russia that, you know, using archives. I mean, maybe, maybe that's something we could think about or perhaps these discussions are taking place in places that I don't know about. One thing we could think about is, you know, where, where can we have these discussions? I mean, we've been having them on Facebook, but everybody's Facebook is different, right? Um, everybody's Facebook is kind of uh, a different kind of um, place. But, you know, I would, I would still <clears throat> put forward the idea that, um, I mean, we can't really just argue that it should be business as usual with Russia. You know, I mean, uh, so I, I do think that there is kind of an important, important statement to be made and if we're just continuing to do joint projects and stuff like that without at least reflecting, I think that's a problem too. Uh, I do think that there is a space to say, okay, we're not we're not going to be doing these these joint projects. Uh, but you know, these are all questions that I, I think deserve like a larger discussion. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. We have a number of questions in the chat and I'm actually going to bundle a couple of them. And the two that I'd like to bundle first are Nancy Condy's question, which speaks to my heart as a chair. That's the question of um, how can we convince our institutions to um, hire in the fields of what they think of as minor languages when we're already struggling to get them to uh, you know, continue to support Russian. Um, and then together with that is David Kokovsky's question about language training in these other languages. Um, these, are, these are both practical and deeper theoretical questions that, um, that I think we need to address. I mean, on a very practical level, I'll say what I'm doing as chair. What I'm doing as chair is rather than trying to convince my administration to hire a Ukrainianist in my department to teach Ukrainian literature and culture, I am begging abjectly and guilt tripping them into, I hope, giving us uh, someone who works on Ukraine in any field who would be half in our department and half in any other department, media, culture, and communications, um, you know, anthropology, history, whatever other cult departments are willing to work with us, um, we would do it that way. And that way to sort of try to get around their anxieties about minorness. And personally at NYU, what I feel is that our deans are always worried about everything minor. To them, everything in the humanities is teeny, teeny and minor, like little flies buzzing around their head and annoying them. So if I start talking to them about things Belarusian, they're just gonna go like that. So I have uh, the, the approach that I hope is gonna work for us institutionally is to pair it with other questions but in a way that lets us bring in Ukrainian expertise, you know, maybe Belarusian expertise, something like that. So that's my first, my, my first response. Does anyone else have response to Nancy's or David's extremely difficult questions? I mean, again, these are also theoretical questions about minorness. Um, let's see, the next, then the next question that I saw, I think was from, um, and this is, this is also a large ethical question from Allison Lee. Allison, would you like to say a few words? Sure, sorry that I don't have my camera on today. I'll just, I'll just read what I wrote, I guess. I, I said that I feel like as an art historian, we're maybe hitting, um, hitting against problems that are slightly unique, you know, in terms of imagery productions and the way that we work so often with some of the state controlled institutions like the Tretikov Gallery, the Russian Museum, the Hermitage, etc. So what I said in the chat is I know several colleagues who are currently debating whether or not they should withdraw, say, essays or chapters from books and exhibition catalogs that have long been in the works um, and are to be published by state controlled and often very pro-Putin, at least at the top level, institutions like the, street, the State Tretikov Gallery. So I've heard concerns about whether we kind of all have a responsibility to say pull out of conferences organized by institutions like these, or use it as a platform to say at the beginning of our talk, express solidarity with Ukraine. These kinds of ethical issues, I don't, they just don't have clear answers. I know I have strong opinions, you know, one way or the other, but I'm really wondering if our speakers might talk to some of these kind of ethical questions that are arising. Thanks to all of you. Um. I'll say something briefly in response to that question, just because I've been involved in a lot of discussions about it at NYU at various levels. Um, the first thing I think is important is to ask Ukrainians and not ask Russianists, you know, how do you feel about participating in seminars with people from Wushka? What do you think about the practice of publishing in Russian journals or, um, and, and, then move on from there. Because what I have seen is that people who have had converse, Russianists who have started out by having conversations with Ukrainians and Ukrainians 
come to different conclusions. So I don't have an answer to the question. I would just say that that's a conversation that shouldn't, in my view, only be had among Russianists. Maybe others have a response to that. I mean, this basically recapitulates the question of sanctions, right? Sanctions are a very blunt instrument. I'll just say a couple of words from as somebody who's in touch with people back in Russia is that the distinction that Ellison has brought up between what the administration says and what uh, the your our colleagues actually do and think on the ground is crucial, right? And obviously, our colleagues can have very different political views, but uh, it's basically kind of uh, a, a question of informal knowledge and trust of who it is you are interacting with on that, that side of things. And I'm not a, a historian who is involved in uh, kind of complex enterprises such as publishing albums, but if we think about how to interact with Russians, is that, uh, uh, yeah, we have to understand who they are, what's going on, and in some cases we might actually be supporting uh, people who are anti-war and are trying to find their voice, and in other uh, situations we might not be doing that. Thank you. Uh, Nancy? Oh, you're muted, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm gonna try to lower my hand in just a second, so I'll be brief. Um, we just ran a four day Ukrainian film festival here at Symposium, substituting for the 23 year uh, Russian film symposium. And of course you can see all the ways in which we could um, have a misstep with our Ukrainian colleagues that came from Davshanka Center uh, to help us run it. And uh, I, I want to, second what Anne said in the following sense that when we ask them, you know, what are the limits and what are the missteps that we could make, we actually heard interesting things we hadn't thought of before. For example, they said, uh, we will sit on no stage where there is a Russian citizen present side by side with us. Now, one could argue with that or what roll your eyes, but I mean, that's what they want. I'm run, my job is to run the event not to adjudicate what their list of, of desiderata are. And so having just asked them first, and they gave us three or four such you know, um, rules, and we followed those rules to the letter and managed not to uh, have a whole lot of uh, profound disagreements. But the, I, the, the trick is to be a listener and not a person of views, which is hard for us academics. So that's it. Thank you very much. I'm realizing that I'm kind of losing control of the chat, which is spinning out of control. Um, let me go back to Irina K, who had, Google, right? Who had um, a question that I missed, I'm sorry. And then we'll go to Marina, whose little yellow hand has been up. Irina. Yeah, I, I wanna, thank you. I wanna raise this question sort of delicately because I think um, we're talking around it and there's a sense, in, in my mind at least, in terms of where our discourse has, not on Facebook, but in other places, the conversations about this, um, the, the way in which that really rapidly spins out of control, um, I think is very concerning for me. Um, that's sort of part of why I started the Rogue Sea Langs Facebook space. So if anybody wants an alternative Facebook space wall to talk about these things, really want to welcome people. Um, I don't want to be censoring anybody. I don't want to be canceling anything. Uh, but it seems like those accusations are being leveraged against people who are trying to reshape the discourse. And I think, you know, I'm a lecturer, um, language teacher. I don't have a lot of uh, positionality in this space to uh, act for change. But I do hope that people who have those positions are, are conscious of the way that shapes the um, impression of our field among graduate students, among our Ukrainian colleagues, and the kind of ways that that impacts, again, the people who go into our field um, and then have a chance to shape it. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say was that it, I'm really grateful for this, um, for this event, and I hear so many things that I want to follow up on. Um, this might be something that is for the Jordan Center, um, but if people would be interested in sharing resources that they found meaningful right now, I'm happy to crowdsource a Google Doc, again, via my weird Facebook pet project, um, which has been really a wonderful place for community in this time. And to make a plug for something that I found out about in that space, which is a book called Contested Tongues. 
um, Language, Politics, and Cultural Correction in Ukraine uh, by Lada Delanyuk, which has really helped me shape my thinking about how I'm going to go into the classroom um, and teach Russian in the fall. So I'll drop a link um, to a Google Doc uh, if anybody wants to pursue that. But I'm just really grateful for everybody who's sharing this expertise because I know that in my own graduate school training, um, there was not a lot of uh, emphasis on Ukraine. And uh, as someone who's from Belarus, um, I do feel that sort of lack in our academic spaces. And I, I'm, I'm grateful for people to drawing attention to that now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irina. And I think that's a huge yes to um, finding a way to, to bring together some of the resources that people have mentioned today. And um, whether through Rogue Ceilings or if you want to do it, um, blog posts in the Jordan Center, just you know, let us know. We'd be happy to support that. Thank you. Um, Marina. Uh, th uh, thank you very much. I'll try to be quick. Just this idea of, um, of kind of limiting access of Russian people to world culture, to world literature, to world arts is to me, it sounds horrible. I, I cannot see anything ethical in this. More so, I even see something unethical in this, like people living in a suppressed country, people living in a, under a tyrannic regime, kind of their conditions are made even worse. And they just wanted to bring one analogy here, analogy like whether you agree or not, whether it's analogical or not with science. I mean, would, would it be ethical to exclude Russian scientists from the world science? And, and such, how will it help world science in general? That's just all I wanted to say. To me, it's just something anti, I just can't imagine it. What reasons a person could have, what, what ethical reasons to say, oh no, I don't want to talk to Russians because, because what? Because Putin invaded Ukraine? Um, okay, thank you. Thank you for the remark. Um, that debate has been joined quite unproductively often on C-Lang. So I think that it might be better to avoid it here. I'm pretty sure that nobody here, um, you know, is practicing cancel culture or wants to exclude Russians or anything like that. Although if anyone else wants to respond or, or echo Marina's idea, that's yeah, I want to respond. You know, uh, as many institutions, uh, Stanford also announced a scholar at risk uh, program, and half of those nominees are from Russian Federation. And we are bringing them on par with Ukrainian scholars who, unlike Russians, cannot even leave majority of them uh, Ukraine because of martial law. So I, I don't understand what Marina was talking about, actually. Okay, thank you for the response. Um, Ilya Vinitsky was next. Ilya, I hope we didn't lose you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yeah, a, a very concrete and a very practical um, uh, question. Like um, last November, I was invited to give uh, a talk uh, at uh, Dostoevsky uh, uh, event uh, organized by our graduate uh, student associated, affiliated uh, mostly uh, with theological seminary. It wasn't introduced uh, by a Catholic uh, priest who uh, worked with the Pope of Rome, actually, and he started the introduction uh, with the words uh, that uh, he was not religious, uh, but he converted to Catholicism after he read the brothers Karamazov, and he was Polish. Uh, and uh, my question uh, to the participants, should I have told uh, him that he misread Dostoevsky because of Dostoevsky's Latin anti-Polish and anti-Catholic uh, sentiments? Or maybe that we uh, misread uh, Dostoevsky by reducing him uh, to this uh, political um, uh, agenda, uh, which actually is present in him. Um, this is an example, but the question is basically on the level of our interpretative endeavors. Uh, are we uh, looking uh, for a superstructure? Are we looking uh, for something on the surface? And how would you deal with the question uh, uh, which, um, well, this situation uh, which I had? I was puzzled once again. Uh, he also mentioned that he converted to Catholicism after reading Brothers Karamazov in a class of Carol Uland at Drew University. Thank you. I love that question. It's pretty crazy. Um, 
is there anyone who would like to respond? Uh, yeah, I could say a couple of words. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, uh, I think that, uh, I don't think that we are reducing Dostoevsky or uh, to, to a political agenda. I think what is actually lacking is a complex enough investigation of Dostoevsky's political agenda, right? Uh, and of course, Ilya has quoted Dostoevsky as just an example, and I'm fully aware of that. So uh, we can talk about Russian 19th century Russian literature in general, right? We uh, w w uh, kind of late Dostoevsky is a great example of because of the intertwinement of, of utterly proto-fascist elements with the legacy of European utopian socialism that has been kind of uh, uh, decisive for him and a lot of other 19th century Russian authors. So uh, focusing on those elements and understanding how they actually work together, right? Different kind of understanding of identities, but also different kind of political agenda, right? How does the church and uh, the idea of freedom work in the brothers Karamazov is, I think, uh, uh, a uh, kind of a nice response that would allow us to uh, uh, go through through those uh, through those kind of quandaries. Thank you. Does anyone else have a response? This also speaks to the issue of, you know, what our students are looking for when they come to Russian literature and what they manage to find in it, <laughs> which is sometimes not exactly what we thought they were going to find or what we even wanted them to find. Ilya? Oh, you're muted. Precisely. I'm thinking for even that. Just yesterday, I was approached by uh, another student who uh, spoke about the issues that uh, she was interested uh, in. And uh, there were like philosophical, religious, uh, theological um, uh, issue, but no ideological and political. And I was already ready to talk to, uh, that, no, there are more important issue. But do I have the right to say that there are more important issue if students are interested in the issue which they are interested um, in? And if someone is interested in versification or uh, someone is interested in genre uh, theory, uh, so there are many things uh, which are still at the table uh, and which we can uh, offer to those students who are interested uh, in uh, them. I don't want to move the discussion into a different uh, direction, uh, but I, I'm just aware of uh, a vast variety of issues uh, which are of students' interest. And uh, do we have the right uh, to uh, lock the door uh, or uh, to offer all students a uh, possibility to discuss and to learn about what they are interested in? Thank you, Ilya. It's, a, it's kind of the classic question of teaching that comes back again and again. So in response, we have next um, Olga Mayorova. And then I see Donna and Jillian have hands up. So Olga. Oh, I have a very brief response to Ilya's question. I don't think that uh, that uh, person misread Dostoevsky because actually it's a big question uh, whether or not um, Dostoevsky criticized Catholicism only or, relig or in religious institutions more generally. And uh, so if they are criticized, you the, the response of an activist would be, I need to join this institution to, to change the situation. So um, I, I, don't, I don't think, it, I don't read it as, uh, as uh, a con confused um, person. I think it's very deep reading of Dostoevsky and his more kind of his broader vision of religious institutions, even though he supported Russia's official, uh, the Orthodox Church. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Donna Orwin. Oh, you're muted, Donna. Yeah, okay, there. Okay, didn't want to let me unmute. Uh, I thought Ilya's question was a really great one. And uh, I would just simply say what I always tell my students is that the text is not the author, that the author is just one reader of the text. And this is very, very clear in Dostoevsky that uh, what he might've thought when he was writing the diary of a writer is not necessarily what comes out of the brothers Karamazov. So 
that's that I think is a, a very and and so the whole issue of esotericism is not is not simply a matter of you know this this tremendous drive driver of 19th century Russian literature, which is that people can't say what they think, so they write literature. They, they they turn to the arts to say things that they can't say openly. That's something we haven't talked about, that esotericism of 19th century Russian literature. Chekhov, no one's talked about Chekhov. Uh, Chekhov is a great example of that. Um, um, but there's also this sort of un unconscious issue. Do we? Do I no longer teach the captain's daughter because Pushkin was a, an imperialist? Uh, that's, that's, I, I do think one does have to separate the author from the text. Thank you, Donna. Um, Jillian, and then Taras. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment on this issue of student expectation and desire. Um, I mean, given this real need um, that we've been discussing following Anne's opening remarks to deconstruct the idea of Russian greatness or the greatness of its literature and cultural traditions, um, I think we're immediately in a predicament where many students who have traditionally come to our courses because they thought the literature would be great, you know, they, they may be disappointed when they find that our agenda is not to help them to like the material, but actually to analyze and specifically critique it or even to decolonize the discipline. And it seems to me that one thing we can do is to think about how the course titles and the course frames are serving to attract a certain group of students. If we keep teaching courses called 19th century Russian literature, we may continue to have those students who come because they think it's going to be great. Um, and it's not that it's not important for us to work with those students, but it may be more productive if we are teaching courses on um, race and ethnicity in the Russian empire or Dostoevsky and African-American literature or topics that will attract students who are deeply engaged in social justice movements today who would actually be eager and talented collaborators with us in the kind of work that we're trying to do. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Jillian. Yeah, this has been an inspiration to us in our department to begin the process of rethinking curriculum. Um, Taras. Yeah, I just wanted to <clears throat> add a couple of comments. Uh, it's, it's not the matter of, you know, no, good writer or great writer especially is a homogenous kind of a product or box and um you know putin might quote baradino but he is not quoting smirk poeta or prashenia um that that's one point that um it's would be counterproductive to just lock uh, a writer or a figure into some kind of a homogenous type of uh, behavior or attitude. Uh, there's development, there's dynamics, and it's it's quite fascinating to, to trace it. Uh, another point that I want to make that pretty much any culture, any artifact can be hijacked for the purposes of whatever regime. Uh, you might recall, uh, again, Putin and Yanukovych in 2013, before the Maidan, discussing their you know, joint plans to celebrate Shevchenko's anniversary, I forget which one. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's that bizarreness of, of uh, but also it's quite common to see um, appropriations of artifacts for political purposes. Does it mean we should stop uh, looking at artifacts? Uh, no, but uh, looking at appropriations on cultural mythologies around these artifacts is certainly useful. And, um, in terms of texts that are uncomfortable, um, again, there is a way of approaching them. Uh, you know, when I teach uh, Kiev, I, te uh, I do include Bulgakov's White Guard, uh, and I do not intend to drop it because I don't only teach Bulgakov's White Guard. I teach Pidmohilny, I teach um, uh, Shalom Aleichem, and I teach Ivashkevich. It's, it's a perspective, and to me, White Guard is just that an expression of a group uh, that constituted a majority, the demographic and cultural majority in Kiev as of 1918, 
and express their opinion of uh, Ukrainian revolution at the time. But because Bulgakov is not a hack writer, there are moments in that text which can be seen as uh, quite uh, anti-Ukrainian. Again, I'm putting in a quotation mark. But there are reasons or there are mechanisms that are quite illuminating to trace and learn from them uh, about this confrontation of groups and communities at the time of imperial collapse. So that these are my three little comments. Thank you. Um, well, I think that we have we have gone over time. Usually we go to two o'clock. Um, I think that we're coming to the end. I, I don't see any more questions. Um, very good suggestions in the chat about um, building this Google Doc that would um, allow us to share resources. Um, uh, again, I want to thank everyone, especially our Ukrainian participants, actually, for, um, for taking part and gives us a lot to think about over the summer. And um, uh, it's much appreciated. Thank you to Sarah Dickinson for running the seminar series. Thank you to Sasha Spitalnik and the Jordan Center for supporting us. And um, 19V seminar series will be back in the fall. Um, and uh, I hope that times will be better. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>